I just want to stop by, uh, thank everybody for, for being here. Especially want to thank Chrissy for my office and Neil for, for co uh, teaching this, this work, uh, workshop. I uh, just want to tell you, this, this is really great to, to see this pitch turnout. Uh, we, want to, we want to empower people with as much information as possible. Uh, this is, as you can see, a complex process, but I, you know, I think we have a very capable person teaching the class with, with Chrissy. And so uh, I want you to know that we're here to listen to, to your concerns, and we'll, we'll be moving this forward in a matter that everybody fully understands what's what's happening. We'll, we're, we'll be working with you, not around you. Uh, and Peter Zanoni, I just want to thank you, the deputy city manager, uh, overseeing this entire process. Uh, he is very much involved. I want to thank him. Uh, he's been a great partner uh, in helping us to establish the right amount of the, the right pace that we need for, for establishing these language categories. Uh, he's he's seen it firsthand that people are interested in learning about this, uh, wanting to learn more about what it means for them and their neighborhoods and the city as a whole. Uh, so with that, if Peter, would you like to say a few words? Uh, thank you, Councilman. As the councilman said, I'm one of the deputy city managers with the city, and one of my oversight uh, areas is the planning department. And uh, we have been working over the past couple of years on the development of the comprehensive plan. Many of you may have been involved or have seen it. And the next step in that overarching plan is doing these uh, individual uh, regional center or neighborhood plans. And uh, that's why you all are here tonight to, uh, to make sure the community is comfortable with your plans. Uh, you have to understand how to develop and what language we're using in there. And so an event like tonight is meant to give you more information in a simpler way. Uh, our staff and planning department uh, are planners, and it's a different style of communicating and teaching. And so uh, we have two uh, non-planning staffers uh, that are going to help teach you tonight, kind of from a lay person's perspective, uh, to help you understand it. And it's critical that you understand and, uh, and, are, and are in agreement with the neighborhood plans and the, the land use classifications and categories. Because uh, they're your neighborhoods, right? They're our neighborhoods. Uh, but if you all don't agree with them, if there's some problems with it, with the plan that's ultimately done, uh, it's not something that's representative of, of your community. And that's that's not good for us, nor is it good for the council that ultimately has to adopt them. So tonight is an effort for you to uh, begin the, uh, or to continue the learning process. And obviously, there's a series of classes that will take place. We encourage you to take as many as you can and uh, to uh, spread the word to your community leaders or your neighbors uh, about uh, how these classes are, maybe get even more people involved. And as the councilman said, I want to thank you on behalf of the city for coming out tonight on a wet night and on a late, uh, late night event. And uh, we hope we get uh, some information that will help you uh, better understand and better communicate these plans uh, to your, to your uh, fellow uh, neighbors as well as the community leaders that you work with. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. So we are definitely going to go over eight o'clock. So if anybody has to leave, please feel free. Uh, but I'm going to try to get as much information in as possible. And this is a hands-on workshop, so you will actually have the opportunity to create as part of this process. So uh, I'm just going to start with a brief introduction. And the first thing everybody wants to know is, what is land use? So a lot of uh, discussion that I have with our community leaders is land use versus zoning. So this is the definition of land use. It is the holistic planning of an area to preserve resources, administer care, and it follows a comprehensive assessment. That's a lot of big words. Let's break it down. Holistic planning. So the word holistic means all-encompassing. So if we're holistically planning an area, we are looking at all pieces of that community and then planning for all pieces of that community. So it could be the people, or it could be the buildings, the land, the services, the businesses, and on and on and on every piece of that community, which is going to be unique for every area. I'm going to jump to comprehensive assessment because it follows a comprehensive assessment, meaning that has to come first. So the first thing you have to do is research, and a lot of it. That involves community input, so you have to meet with the people in the area. It could be technical surveys and analyses, so what is the annual income of the area that you're looking at. What is the average household size? What is the demographic of the people? Is it a community that is primarily senior citizens? Is it a community that has more young individuals? Is it a community that has historically had a lot of crime? Is it an area that 
that has had a lot of um, stormwater issues. So all of those technical surveys and analyses are taken into account to give a holistic view of what's going on. We also use census data to get a lot of that information. Now right now, we're going based on our 2010 census, which was many years ago. And as many of you know, San Antonio has changed a great deal in those years. And so soon, for many of you in the room who will be part of your four and five, you will have the opportunity to have the 2020 census, which is an added benefit to you of having that updated census data. But the planning department does also put together some information um, as part of the, the analyses that they do prior to an area, and they, they publish those documents with statistics and analysis, things like that. Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, which is just <coughs> finding everything you can about an area, its history, its culture, to preserve the resources. Most people, when they hear resources, they think natural resources, such as our water, our land, our energy, our food, all of those types of things. But it could be community resources, like the education that's there, the services, the businesses, preserving small businesses. It could be the cultural resources, like the heritage of an area, the culture and character of that community, the arts that are per present within that community, or, a lot of people forget this one, it could be preserving infrastructure resources. So the existing streets, the drainage, the sewers, right? A lot of communities within the center city were built in silt, which means that our sewers are havoc wreaked upon them every time it rains, and those sewers shift underground, they start to crack, especially the old ones that are made out of clay. So those take preservation and should be part of the comprehensive planning process. It could also be utilities, right? CPS lines or um, you know, putting in Google Fiber as part of a, a further planning process. So any number of infrastructure resources are also considered to administer growth. Now, because of a lot of what's happened in the city, when you hear administered growth, most people think of construction. They think of growing big, tall skyscraper buildings. It doesn't have to be. It could be more and better housing, growth of the businesses or economy in an area, improvement on that infrastructure, improvement or increase of services. So if your demographics and research come back and show that a community is primarily senior citizen and they have primarily low incomes, but there are no senior services available in that community, that is an area for growth that should be part of that comprehensive plan. It could be to develop the education, the arts, the culture. And what these priorities are are going to be determined by you, the community, as part of that planning process to say, we need more of this. These are our areas of growth. What is it that's important to your community and it doesn't have to be development in the construction sense. It could be development of a resource. Any questions about the definition? Emil, did you want to add to that? So now we are going to apply this a little bit. So we're in Portland, New York. I chose Portland, New York because my grandma lives there, and I know it very, very well. But you don't necessarily have to know it very well to identify what this area right here is. So I have four land use categories, and we're all going to do this as, as a group in just a minute. But my four land use categories are residential, mixed use, multifamily, and commercial. So if I'm looking at this area right here in an aerial view, what do you think is most likely the land use category that's applicable to that area? Residential. Using our analysis of our visual abilities. Now, I'm going to teach you how to use this software. This is fantastic. I strongly recommend you all as community leaders to use this software. I use it to track zoning changes. I use it to track infrastructure, um, and then you, as community leaders, can put together a map of your community, what you like, what you see, what you don't like, and present that to planning staff when it comes time. So this is Google Docs. So here I am in my drive, and I go to make a new document, and I go to Google My Maps. I'll take a picture. Michelle, I've got some pictures of Andrews. <laughs> And I'm going to go back to my map. So this is what pops up. You go here, right here, draw a line, click, draw a line, 
And I am going to outline, you have to click every time you want a dot to appear. I'm going to outline this area. And it is now residential. And I'm going to make it the color that I made residential, which is red. If you wanted to change or edit this in any way, you click on it, click edit, and then I could adjust these here, and clean up some of these lines, just like that. So once you're done with an area, it would look like this. So this is an example of a land use map where I took the core residential area and I made it residential. These here are industrial warehouses and so I made them industrial. This is my commercial corridor so I went through the alley and around and I outlined the commercial area. This area here is mixed use because it's got a mix of apartments, a mix of small offices, retail spaces, so it's my mixed use area. This is all apartments, so it's all multifamily, so I made multifamily, a little bit more commercial up here, and then another section of residential up there. So this is what it should look like when it's done. Now it's your turn. So Neil and I are going to pass out some things for you. I'd like you all to find a partner. Go first, wait. Don't let go away from me yet. What you're going to do is you're going to get a map, and all the maps are different, so you don't have to look at your at the table. And you are going to cut out a section of your map so that it directly overlays on top of a color that indicates with a land use category. So I have four land use categories with colors indicated. You will cut them out and then you will cut out the adjacent area so that it also matches a different land use category and then they fit together like a puzzle until you have done your whole map and then you will have your land use map for your very small area. So you and your partner are going to get a map, you have scissors and cardstock at the center of your table, and you are also going to get a land use category guide. Okay, raise your hand if you used every color. Okay, raise your hand if you did not use every color. And that's okay. <laughs> that is absolutely okay because what that means is, is that you are tailoring it to your area and not every area has every type of development. Uh, what, all your maps are different by the way, so oh. <laughs> What I have just handed out to you, if you want to go ahead and flip it over, is the zoning code that we will be using for this workshop. So it is a simplified version of a zoning code. And what I would like you to do is on each of your colored sections, I want you to write down what zoning codes are included in that. So for example, if you have a section of blue where there are large commercial box stores, you would put BC. And any other blue square has to be BC as well. So if you write it in one blue square, it has to be in every blue square that you have. And then you'll go ahead and go through and apply all of your zoning categories into your land use categories. In the furthest row, I left blank. And I want you to transcribe those zoning categories from your colored blocks onto your land use categories. Okay. So what I would like to know now is what did you notice when you were cutting out your map? It was the same. Okay? It was hard to tell what things were, right? And I hear a lot of that, and that's important, because what I want you to notice is that it, it does take more analysis, right, than just looking at the map and drawing lines. So what are some things that you could have done that would have made this easier for you? Absolutely. What else could you have done? He wanted to know where to put those lines. Tax data. You could look at tax data, absolutely, to see are these duplexes or are these single family residences, right? So VCAT has a lot of that information. What else could you could you do? 
to give them a, a sense of where to draw the lines. I felt it was very um, subjective. If I was in charge and I got to cut this all myself, and I can cut it up in multiple ways all day long, right? It is. So I'm afraid I would hate to act on my own and arbitrarily make decisions based on, without having a lot more information Correct. with a lot more people Absolutely. care about that. And that was why the very first thing that you do is the research, right? All of those things that we talked about is needed in order to accurately draw these lines. Unless you said if it was for your grandmother, then you knew most of that area. That's right, and I did. So now, where did you end up drawing the lines? We guess. You guess a lot of on the streets, right? You cut them on the borders. Yeah. It's the clean line. You can see those lines, and so it's easy to draw those lines. Yeah. But do our development patterns change based on the street lines, or based on how wide the street may be so that you can see it on the map, or a highway, for example, does that change the development pattern? Yes. Absolutely. What about natural features? Did anybody cut along a, a river or a drainage channel of any kind? No. We cut it on the street. Yeah. On the street. <laughs> and, and maybe you did. I know <laughs> last time Tony was like, it's on the river. I was like, natural features. Natural features divide a community. Right, you talked about that last time. And so that could very well be where you have driven, drawn your lines. So what I would like you to do now is I would like to know what is a category that you wished you had had? So I know, Anne, you have mentioned a couple. So she said to me, she said, well, these are warehouses, that's industrial, but we don't have industrial. And someone else asked for public institutional, which is a very common category, right? If you want to designate something public institutional. So what I'd like you to do right now is go ahead and look at your map. And based on what you have, what is a category that you wish you could have? So it could be two versions of something. Big commercial, little commercial. Think about where you've applied your zoning. Are there lines that you wish you could have drawn between different types of retail spaces? And go ahead, write that category on the bottom row of your land use category and sky. So I'm very curious to know. Did you put, raise your hand if you put the big R in the residential category? Raise your hand if you put the big R zoning category in the residential land use category. Raise your hand if you put it in multifamily. Mixed use. Anybody put it in mixed use? Could you put it in both or either? Absolutely, depending on the style and character of that neighborhood, right? And so you start to see, really you start to shape. So in your land use categories, there is another column. It is the description of what those land use categories are, and that is very important. It defines it. And so if it's a residential category, but you didn't put the big R there, you put the big R somewhere else, you might define that rather than just suburban neighborhoods, you might say suburban single family neighborhoods. And then in your multifamily, apartment style living and duplexes, right? You might qualify that, you might add in those descriptors. So what I would like you to do, I give you a little bit of extra space on that worksheet. So look at each category, including the one that you have created, and expand that definition a little bit based on what is in your area. So did you split up your commercial? Do you have different types of mixed use? It's, it's different than and something to think about is that if every single zoning category has to fit into a res a land use category, and these are the only options that you have, if you did not create an industrial category when you chose to go through them, where is your industrial going to go? 
So if every zoning category has to be in a land use category, where is your industrial going to go? <laughs> okay, we're going to do one more thing with the maps, and then there's one other thing I wanted to go through with you before we adjourn for today. So the last thing I'd like you to do is to, based on your map and looking at the aerial shot that you have, identify an area for growth. Now remember, we defined growth in many different ways. And I want you to put an asterisk on that part of the map. And I want you to think about what that growth would be. Now before you start, because I know a lot of you are already looking for those vacant parcels for construction, <laughs> growth could be infrastructure. So if you see that there are no streets wide enough for through traffic, that could be an area for growth. So really be creative with what that growth might look like. <laughs> What did we come up with? <laughs> Before we move on to the last thing we're going to cover, which is plan amendment, I am curious, what are your thoughts so far about this? Love it. We should be engaged this way with the city all the time. Oh, thanks. I don't work for the city. But, but that's okay. <laughs> I'm not saying that. It's a, a, this could, you know, you could literally see what's going on. Yes. And one of the things, I mean, that's why we're doing this, right? So that you can really see how these things are formed and created. But also, using this software, you can create a map of your neighborhood. And it's okay. free. It's easy access, it's very easy to use, and then you can bring that with you when you are in your planning area so that you already have that research. And following Anne's suggestion, I would definitely recommend involving as many people as you can in that process of creating your map for your, for your area. Okay, so the last thing we're going to cover is a plan amendment. So there are three I would say there are three kinds of plan amendments, or three ways that a plan amendment can look. How many of you put office in your commercial land use category? For what? How many of you put office in your commercial land use category? Either, either type of office. Okay. So we have some people that consider office commercial spaces. Let's pretend for a moment that my map, I put office as part of my commercial land use category. This yellow strip right here. Somebody comes to me and they say, I work for DSD. I don't actually, but in this story, I work for DSD. And they say, I would like to open an office right here. Please give me my CFO. And I say, OK. And that does not require a plan amendment because office is included in the commercial category. And so they can open their office, and the map did not change. Then somebody comes to me and they say, I would like to open a home office. And I live right here. So I would like to have my home office right here. And it is approved. We're going to talk about whether or not I think should or should not be approved. That is a discussion for a later day because Emil and I argued for a solid hour about an imaginary zoning change and whether or not it should or should not have been approved a couple of days ago. So we don't want to get into that. But let's say it is approved, and so they get their CFO, and the map has changed. We call this commercial encroachment because in order to have an office, the yellow has to expand. It has to be yellow. The parcel has to be yellow in order for them to have an office in that land use category. They have to match. Which means that the pink isn't there anymore. It is now just yellow. So it's not a house. It's not residential. It is now an office. And it is reflected on the map. We call this commercial encroachment because the commercial is encroaching. Uh, very good to see. Now, this person comes in right here, and they say, well, my neighbor down the street just opened a home office, and I, too, would like to have a home office. And they come in, and they request it, and it is approved. This parcel is now also yellow, 
And it is also designated commercial. It's not pink anymore. It is now office. Has it commercial forever? Gross. So these are three kinds of plan amendments. So the first kind, the map didn't change. The second kind, time, the yellow, the existing yellow, expanded. And the third time, we have a new yellow section that is surrounded entirely by pink, and there's no other yellow around it. So these are things to consider when asking whether or not you should approve a plan amendment. Is how does the map look? And whether or not it's right, whether or not um, it should be approved, is up for discussion, right? So in the last workshop we were talking, somebody said, well, wouldn't you want to consider the infrastructure and if it can support that type of use? Absolutely. If you were over here, where there is no yellow, but this is a, a major corridor, and right here we have some businesses, there's some businesses across the street, businesses across the street here, Maybe it might make sense to do it here because the, the infrastructure can support it, but that is up for discussion. So when a plan amendment is proposed, this is an important thing to look at because as you're assigning those areas in that category, remember, if it's outside, the zoning category is outside of that land use, it requires a plan amendment. It requires a change. And so if you as a community would like to see home offices, then maybe this area should be mixed use. Or maybe home offices should be included in that land use category from the beginning. There are also options like a conditional use that you can do that don't change the base zoning. And so those are things to look at as well because those don't change the map. And so those are all options, but this is just what it looks like, because I know a lot of people, it's very hard to visualize a plan amendment, and you want to approve the zoning change, because sure, why shouldn't this person be able to have their attorney office? They bought the house for it, you know, but this is what it looks like. So whether or not it's right, or you like it, is up for discussion. Not right now, but it would be. But this is what it looks like. But also you have to wonder what the zoning is for that home office, because that person may be like, fine, that's a great idea to have a home office, but if it's zoned C1, it's like there's all kinds of other uses that yes. may not be covered. So, and so we have a saying in my neighborhood, love is short, but zoning is forever. So zoning and land use, because remember, this is a commercial designation, so zoning and land use. It is now yellow. And so anything you put in your commercial category, including, because we had such a limited scope, including high-rise offices, including if you put big commercial and small commercial and small offices, all of those are all included here. Now there is zoning, so there is more restrictive on a specific parcel, but the land use category and just the land use map would include all of those things. Yes. So uh, do you think we're moving towards um, a system where if the zoning is within a land use, that it will just get zoning change automatically? No. You don't think so? No, like, I don't. Okay. The center city, I think there is more of that because we just get more zoning changes. Right. Um, we have a lot of, of mixed use communities. Um, we have a lot of, or the, you know, this could be yellow and this could be blue and this could be pink, but that's very specific to the center city. Okay. Outside of that, there are many council districts that would never even consider it. You know, the plan amendment, absolutely not. Or, you know, you know, the entire community is pink as far as you can see, and it's all zoned R5, and they don't want to park for it. They don't want their space. Right. So, I mean, yeah, the, I, I have not seen that uh, huh. at all. Yeah, but I do think the boundaries of, a, of like a compromise, that is oftentimes comes into play. Mm -hmm. Because as we talked about, if this could have been a conditional use and didn't change the base zoning but still allowed them to do the home office, that may be the maximum um, zoning that, that is allowed. But that's because the, the idea of the home office is not terrible to people. If the idea of the home office was terrible, then the whole thing would be good. Yes? So, Chrissy, then you might find that Maybe you do. So then, why would they be like certain particular buildings of, of like on a particular side of town, like you just have 
for example, the jail and the bell bonds. I mean, how does that get? I mean, sweetheart jail. No, I know, I know it is. <laughs> sure, and, 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 and then then you know, I know it's bad because I, I know, but I just from you, from your, from you, in terms of this matter. So, so I know exactly the areas you're talking about. A lot of it had to do with. Um, so we used to have a different kind of zoning code, and now I'm completely digressing and keeping all your labels. But for those of you who don't know, uh, we used to have a very different zoning code. What we used to have was actually a dry erase marker. It was a, uh, a triangle, where the top tier of the triangle was like residential estate, so like big, rambling houses. And the bottom of that was uh, double J, which was high intensity industrial. And the difference between that system and the system we have today was that if you had double J zoning, you could do anything above it. So you could build a single family neighborhood, or you could build bonds or you could build a factory and most of the areas of the city that are double were double J zoning were the areas that were redlined like the west side and so when that code converted you it all converted to i2 mostly um, and so that's how you end up with neighborhoods with industrial zoning on them because they were saying well jj was our industrial zoning so that makes sense but it doesn't make sense because that's not what's on the ground and so that's where we get a lot of the, what we call code conversion errors, where, where it didn't transfer. So like Rio Road, where you see all those bail bonds, a lot of it is industrially zoned or like C3 zone. And so what you would want, and what we've actually initiated in the District 1 portion of that community, is a, a large area of rezoning to fix that, to, to make it what it ought to be. Um, and it comes out of the planning processes. You can do a large area of rezoning after a planning process, because if you say, well, this area, it's residential, you can clear out the commercial zoning because it doesn't match the land use. So who makes those decisions? I would hope that you would. Well, I didn't make a decision to put bell bonds on that. Is there somebody else that's doing that? Not those businesses specifically, okay. but what the zoning is on the property. It was just history. Yeah, I mean, that, that's what's been there, and so nobody's actively changed it. Okay, so I know we're super late. Are there any questions about the workshop generally? Anything that we talked about today? Um, kind of the process moving forward? What are some of the things we can do to get a world vote first? So that we can have conversations with city officials. Sure. So that's the intent of these workshops, right? So starting with, with opportunities like this. Um, you just told me about it here. What? Yeah, so the uh, reading documents is huge, but what, the, one of the reasons why we're doing this series is because we found that when people were reading documents or just going to city meetings, they didn't have the prerequisites, the background knowledge, <laughs> to get yeah. to that. Now, one of the things so. you're doing is your neighbor area, drive the area and see what the land is, and also compare it to what the zoning is, and see what, what you see, and maybe some issues. The, the zoning map for the city is online. You can access it. I think we can do that. It's digital. Yeah, I mean, you're absolutely right. You're printing it as a person. I learned about zoning. If I can answer a question with that question. Uh, if, you, if you want to learn about zoning more, I don't know if you do this. I spent four hours at a zoning zoning thing, uh, and I learned so much that was going on as car washes coming in and all that kind of, that's where I learned about them. Yeah. Four hours, we were very different things coming through. They can't believe that they, they get his own from some of these. Well, I like that idea, actually. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, um, as you see more and more community leaders wanting to get involved, more and more people are doing workshops like this one. Um, and so I think you'll keep seeing things like this cropping up. And so making sure that you, you go to those. Um, I found when I was learning the zoning code, especially for the city, like practicing with it. And so, uh, you know, like she said, take the zoning agenda. Even if you can't go to the hearing, just look at the agenda and say, oh, well, C3 to I1. Okay, well, well what is that? And if, does, if it says, you know, a pending plan amendment, well, then you know it requires a change, like this one. And so, you know, just kind of looking at it and getting a sense of, of what the codes are. Okay. Um, we out of our office have created several documents to just help simplify a lot of this stuff. So I'd be happy to share those as well.
Um, yeah, we'll probably email those out once we've heard of some of them.